So today we're going to be talking about faith, but specifically we're going to be talking about dominion faith. A lot of Christians do not realize what dominion is, and some of them don't realize what faith is. So we're going to cover a little bit of that today, if you wouldn't mind. So recap from last time, um, before our Halloween message, I hope all y'all caught that Halloween message. But just to recap, we were talking about renewing the soul, renewing the mind. And if you remember, the soul is your mind, your will, and your emotion, which can direct your thoughts, desires, and the actions of your flesh. The soul can direct the actions of your flesh. That's why it's so important for us to renew our minds daily to the Word of God. So we're not led by the Spirit of the world, but we're led by the Spirit of God. We also stated that a renewed soul, which is what you want, a renewed mind, a renewed soul that's renewed to the word and to the will of God, we stated that a soul, a renewed soul specifically, is a soul that is led by the Spirit of God, led by the Spirit of God and not by the Spirit of the world. And how much of that do we see today where everything is led by the Spirit of the world? I mean, it's pretty obvious and evident. I mean, look at the elections for crying out loud. I've never in history seen something like this happen. I mean, just just straight out evil and slanderous and just backbiting and every dirty trick in the book is being pulled out. It's just, you know, it's horrible. So anyway, we also said that God has caused us to live a life worthy of the calling that has been set before us in who? Christ Jesus. So we have a, a walk. We have some boots to fill, you know. So he has called us to live this life because this life that's worthy is a life in the spirit. Okay, it's the only kind of life that truly glorifies God because God is a spirit, right? And we have his spirit in us. So if we're going to glorify a God who is a spirit, we need to live life in the spirit. This is because it is the only life where the children of God are able to exercise their authority and their dominion over this fallen world. In other words, the spirit life is where we walk in the fullness of Christ, the fullness of Christ. So walking in the fullness of Christ is called dominion life. It's called dominion life. But in order to have dominion life, in order to live that out, you have to have dominion faith. So what is dominion? What is dominion? I want to go back to the very beginning in Genesis. Look at this. Genesis 126. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Notice it's plural, not just God. Jesus was there in the beginning, too, and the Holy Spirit was there, okay? Trinity. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Let them have dominion over all these things. Look at the next verses. And so God created man in his own image, in his image, okay? In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them, and God blessed them. They say God cursed them. No, God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, subdue it, and have dominion. He's telling us how to treat the earth. He's telling us how to rule in this earth. He's telling us to subdue it and to have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. How many of you know that a virus is a living thing? Didn't he just tell us to have dominion over viruses, over sicknesses, over illness? Because those are all germs. Those things are all alive. And we're supposed to have dominion over these things. The things of the fallen world are supposed to be under our feet. This is what he's telling you here. And I'm getting ahead of myself. But we'll look at, look at the definition of dominion. Rada, that's the Hebrew word, means to tread down, to tread down. Not just gently walk up and, and take it captive, to tread it down, okay? To subjugate, specifically to crumble off Come to make or make to have dominion, okay? Uh, prevail against, prevail against. Now, if you're going to prevail against something, that means that something is resisting you, okay? If you're prevailing against it, it means it's giving you friction. What does all sickness, illness, and disease do? It brings you friction, right? Well, God's telling us to prevail over these things, okay? And it says to bear, to make ruler over, to take a rule and have dominion, to dominate, to dominate. We're supposed to dominate the things in this fallen world. Why? Because we have the Spirit of God in us. Okay? But it's also, that's how we were designed. So Adam was created to have dominion, right? That's originally how it was in the very beginning. Adam was created to have dominion. He was created to rule over everything. What does the name Adam mean, church? You know what Adam means? Every name in the Bible has a meaning. You know what Adam means? Adam means mankind. 
So guess what? God created mankind to rule. Mankind. We are mankind, are we not? Unless you're an alien, you really, I don't know, maybe you are. Who knows? But he created us to rule, okay? So Adam, meaning mankind, so mankind was created to, by God to rule over everything. So some people at this point may tell me, oh, well, you know, Pastor, that was before the flood. So everything's different now. Well, is it? Let's take a look. Psalms 8, after the flood. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Psalms 8. We'll spend a little bit of time here, but uh, Psalms 8, here we go. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. He's praising God, right? He knows David. David's always praising God. He always takes every opportunity to praise God. That's how he always starts his prayers off, is praising God. It said, who has set the glory above the heavens? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength. Out of the mouth of babes. Baby Christians is what he's talking about. Or just children who believe God, okay? So out of the mouth of babes and suckling hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies. So we see an enemy, and then we see that God has drawn his strength from children, from the foolish things of the world, that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. So this scripture, what, he's, what this scripture is, is an image of dominion, okay? So God can use foolish and inexperienced baby Christians to defeat even the strongest enemy even the strongest enemy, okay? This is the kind of dominion power God can yield through even a child who has just the, the faith of the grain of a mustard seed. You know, children are taught unbelief, okay? We don't, we don't, we don't, we're not born into unbelief. We're taught unbelief. We may be born into sin, but we are taught unbelief by the world. Look at the education system. Look at the way things are run nowadays. We are all taught unbelief. Every time you turn on the TV, you see, TV, you see some kind of commercial some kind of commercial for some kind of drug, for some kind of sickness, blah, blah, blah. Everybody's sick, everybody's dying, take this drug. By the way, this drug might kill you before the actual disease does. We're taught to fear, okay? We're taught to doubt. It's no wonder that Christians have a hard time walking in dominion because they have to unlearn all the programming of the world that they've had so many years of experience in. That's why we have to renew our minds daily, daily. Not just, you know, on Sundays or Tuesdays or Wednesdays. Every single day, you got to walk the walk and talk the talk. You get what I'm saying, church? So God can use even a child to bring his will and power and power. Now, Paul talks about this because if you think about a child and God yielding power through him, a person would think that was absurd or maybe even foolish. But Paul even says that. Look at this in 1 Corinthians. He says, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Because it's these wise people are like, this person is just a child. How could God use that person? How could God use this child as a mouthpiece? How could that child give me a word? I'm a pastor of a church. This child's only eight years old. How could God possibly use him? That's the way people think. You know, especially people up there in the church, you know, they just, they think like that. They have this pride, this chip on the shoulder. But God's saying right here that he chooses the foolish things of the world to confound those wise people, the know-it-alls. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. What's weaker than a child? Well, a child's pretty strong if he's in the Lord, right? So God tells us this. But he also said this. And this is just a little side note. He says, um, he steals the avenger. You know what that means? To steal something? That's S-T-I-L-L. That means to stop it dead in its tracks. He says he comes after the enemy. Okay, he'll steal the enemy and the avenger. So we know the enemy, Right? comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's the enemy, all the enemies of God. But what about the avenger? What's the difference between the enemy and the avenger? Well, the avenger is the only person who would actually have a right to come against you. An avenger is the one who gets revenge on you because of something you did. But God's saying right here that I will even stop that person. Yeah, you messed up. Yeah, that person wants to come against you. But you know what? I'm God. I'll even stop that person. doesn't matter whether or not you deserved it. I'm your father in heaven. I'm not going to let anything happen to you. Now, the reason why I'm saying that is because there's a doctrine out there, and I used to subscribe to it too, that you can open doors to the devil and give him permission to tread all over you, and that's just not true. It's not. This scripture alone says God will steal the avenger. So even if you open a door to the enemy, God's saying right here, I'm still going to stop him. So that kind of throws that mode of thinking completely out the window. Completely. If you're a child of God, you're covered by the blood, period, period. The only difference between a person who walks in the power and the glory of God and the person who does not is one person knows the truth and the other one doesn't. So the one who doesn't know the truth, the devil will try to steal, to kill, and to destroy, and to lie to that person, to make that person think, yeah, you open the door to me, I'm going to come and take you out. And as long as that person confesses that over their life, that's what will happen because of their confession. 
The enemy doesn't have the power. The person with the confession of his mouth has the power. And the devil knows that. That's why he tries to get you to confess lies so he can have his way with you. You get what I'm saying? You see how, the, how slippery the devil is, how he works? It's all with your confessions, church. You got to watch what you say. You got to speak only life. God said in Deuteronomy, I said before you, death and life. Therefore, choose life. That way you and your seed will live. Why would God tell you you have a choice if you didn't have a choice? He says, speak life. He says, choose life. That means every single day, every single conversation you have, every single uh, decision you make, you have a choice of life or death and how you do it. Even the smallest thing, you have a choice on how you handle that. Either you look through it through the God filter or through the world filter. You either speak to it through the God filter or you speak through it through the world filter. And we'll have to do another one on confessions at another time. So in Exodus 14, 14, God says, the Lord shall fight for you and he shall hold your peace. This is just something to follow up on the fact that God does indeed still the avenger, the only person who would have a, a right, as you, if you want to call it that, to come against you. But God says, if you just chill out and know that I'm God, I will take care of you. He, but you have to know that he's God. Now look at Psalms 8. Let's keep going on verse 3. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him. So what's David doing here? He's, he's marveling at God's creation, right? He's like, man, God, look at all these awesome things that you have created. Look at all that. What are you doing wasting time with me? Look at this amazing thing. Someone so vast, so great, so powerful, and you're going to pay attention to me? So David's in awe of how God feels towards him and towards us. He's just amazed that God is even mindful of us, okay? This shows a relationship. Remember, we have dominion, but that dominion means we understand our relationship with our Father, okay? So why would God take such special interest and care in us? Why? Well, because we're made in his image. We're made in his likeness, okay? And he gave us dominion, which means he put us in charge of earth. He wants to see what we're going to do with it. We have stewardship over this earth, right? So we have to be a good steward of what he has given us. I've made you just like me, son, Here's the keys to the kingdom. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to waste it? Are you going to live a defeated life? Or are you going to live to the fullest of Christ the way we were designed to live? He did this because he loves us, you know? He loves us so much he gave us the keys to the kingdom. Look at this in the next verse, in um, verse 5. It says, For thou hast made him, talking about us, a little lower than the angels, talking about man, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. How many of y'all heard this scripture before that we are made a little lower than the angels? Well, let me tell you something. A lot of people don't know that the true Hebrew of angels, you know what that means? The, the, the Hebrew word for angels in this context here out of Psalms 8 means Elohim, which is God. He made us lower than him, not the angels. He made us a little lower than himself. This is the actual Hebrew of what it says. So we're made a little lower than Elohim. Okay, now what does crowned mean? Crown means to encircle, to encircle for attack or protection. Attack the enemy, he protects us. To surround, so he's surrounding us with his love and his glory, right? And it says here, what is glory? It's copiousness. Now copiousness means abundant supply, an abundant supply. And it says abundance, riches, splendor, dignity, reputation of honor and reverence. He made us like that. He gave us all these things to walk in these things and honor means magnificence, an example, splendor, beauty, comeliness, excellency, glorious, and majesty. And the scripture says, for thou hast made him a little lower than Elohim, a little lower than himself, and has crowned him with glory and honor. That's what all these definitions mean. God has made us like this. It sounds like he made us a lot like him, right? So God made us to be what? Surrounded by protection and strength. He made us to be abundantly supplied with every good thing every good thing, and he made us to walk with dignity, excellency, and majesty. He made us to be honorable. Look, at, there's no honor to, in today's world anymore. There's no honor went out the window years ago. God loves honor. He loves it when you honor him, when you honor his word, when you honor people. But above all things, you honor his word. We have to have honor as a Christian, you know. So God made us just like him. Just a little lower is what he says, and this is not... Something I'm just telling you, this is what the Word of God say. Everybody agree with that? Amen? It's pretty awesome. Look at this next verse. In verse 6, it says, Thou made him to have dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet. All things. Did he say some things? 
He said all things, all things under his feet. Now this is confirmation, okay, that God's mandate for us to have dominion with Adam, it's still applicable now, even in this time, even before Jesus, it was still valid. Even though Adam gave a power and authority to Satan at the, in the fall, we still have dominion. When Satan was operating, remember when Satan was testing Jesus, if you're the son of God, throw yourself all these cliffs, and the angels will catch you. All, and, and he said, what did he tell Jesus? He said, uh, if you would just fall down and worship me, I'll give you all this stuff. He showed him all the kingdoms because it was his to give. But the authority that he was operating in was the same authority and dominion that Adam had. So everything that Jesus did, uh, that the devil did, we were we are supposed to be able to do as well. But even then, even more so now because we have Jesus, okay? So all the devil was doing was operating in the same authority and dominion that was handed over to him by Adam. That's all he was doing, okay? So slide of hand, he tried to trick us, right? But we have that dominion. We have that authority because of Jesus. But it was always God's mandate for us to have that authority even before Jesus. And we see this here in Psalms 8. It's always been God's plan for us to rule. Always has been. Of course, man has made a mess of that, right? So he has put all things under his feet, or our feet, and under our control. Because that's what it is, it's under our control. And the same thing was said about Jesus in Hebrews. Look at this. This will look familiar. This is Hebrews 2.5. He says, For it was not to the angels that he was subjected the world to come. It wasn't uh, the, the angels that he gave authority over the world. It was us, okay, of which we are speaking. But someone in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? It was David. We know it was David that testified. Or the son of man that you care for him, and you made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with the glory and honor, and set him above or over the works of your hands. So the Old Testament reference was, was to us, and the New Testament reference is talking about Jesus, okay? But the Scripture still applies to us. Even though he's talking about Jesus in this context, it still applies to us. Why? How? How is that possible? Because the moment we came to salvation, that is a baptism of unity. We were joined with Christ. There's no longer a, a I who live, but the Christ who lives in me. So what applies that Jesus applies to us because we are the body of Christ. Okay, everybody follow me? We are the body of Christ. So the, you, this unity, this baptism, it turned us into the body of Christ. Look at Romans 12, 5. So we being many are one body in Christ. We are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. We're all a part of each other, all of us. Okay, we can't separate ourselves. Okay, look at the next one, 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. So that's why we call it the family of God because we literally all are blood family because of Jesus, because of Jesus. So God has put the world under our control. He's given us uh, this amazing opportunity to reign and rule, but hopefully to do it after the image of Christ and not after the image of the world. Look at this in Hebrews 2, 2 and 8. He says, you have put all things in subjection under his feet, for in subjecting all things under him, he left nothing that is not subjected to him. Talking about Jesus. Yet now we do not see all things subject to him. Why are not all things subject to Jesus? I want to get ahead of myself here, but look at this. What does subjection mean? Subjection means to put under one's control. Okay? So why does Paul say that not all things are under his feet? Well, who's his feet? If we're the body of Christ, who's the feet of Jesus? You better be raising your hand because he's talking about us. We are the feet of Jesus. And the only reason why things would not be subject to us is because we're not walking in dominion the way we're supposed to. That's why it says right here that not all things are subjected to him. When you put the word under your feet, you put them under Jesus' feet because we are the body of Christ. We are Jesus' feet. So we are designed from inception to reign and rule in Christ's name. And, of course, when he comes and we have the thousand-year millennial reign, guess what? He's going to show us how it's done. Okay, but for right now, it's our job to have that dominion. It's our job to operate that way because that's how he made us. So God created mankind to walk in his power and his authority. So when we confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, he confirmed that dominion permanently belongs to us. And he also permanently declawed Satan, permanently threw him off to the side. He's nothing anymore. All he can do is lie into giving you, uh, letting you give him authority by your confessions. Okay, so, I mean, it's just like a, an example would be in the natural. You know, my son looks just like me. He's going to have a lot of my attributes. He's going to be athletic. He's going to be taller than me because we have a tall gene 
in our family, but why would it not be the same with God? If we're made in his image and his likeness, don't you think we're going to be just like him? That's how he made us. That's what creation does. Made in his image and his likeness. I mean, the evidence is all there. Even genetics, even God aside, the evidence is all there. The children look like their parents, and they have their attributes. They have, you know, special qualities about them. If maybe they were athletic, or maybe they were smart, whatever it was, that's all present in there in the genome. Now look at this in Ephesians, because God has power, and so do we. Look at Ephesians 1.19. He says, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who what? Who believe. What is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, which he performed in Christ, it's because of Christ we have this power, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in heavenly places. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that dwells in us. And it's available to those who believe, who have faith to believe it. Available to those who walk in dominion, okay? And if you don't, then you don't walk in that power, and you're not truly glorifying God. Look at the next verse, 121. It says, far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Dominion over all these things. Jesus has dominion over these things. We have dominion over these things. Now, the dominion in this one is actually different. Look what it says. This one is the Greek word. It means a ruler, government, power, lordship, and one who possesses dominion. If we have dominion over this kind of dominion, that means if there's wicked rulers that fit this category right here of a ruler, a government, or a power, or a lordship, we have dominion over them. Why? Because they're not submitted to God. They're submitted to the devil. And we have authority over everything in this fallen world. Amen? You get what I'm saying? Amen? Now look at this, Ephesians, let me see right here, Ephesians 1.22, and he put all things in subjection under his feet and made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all things in all ways. So Ephesians said that Jesus is seated far above all principalities, all powers, all might, all dominion, and everything that is named. Jesus has dominion over it all, right? He has authority and power over it all, right? Amen? But we do too. Why? Because we're the body of Christ. Look at Ephesians 2, 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So just like Jesus is set up in heavenly places, we are too. And it says that right here. Isn't that awesome? To know how, that God loves you that much, that he give you that kind of power and authority, kind of puts pressure on you like, oh, man, Lord, I, I don't want to mess this up. But we should think like that. That's called a holy reverence for God when you take him serious. And Christianity is not just a, you know, you say a prayer, then you, you know, go on with your life. That's, that's not, man, it's a life change. It's a lifestyle. It's, it's, you, should be, you should be completely unrecognizable after salvation. You should walk away from your old life completely and start living this godly life, this righteous life we're called to live, a life of power, a life of authority. Why? For God's will and for God's purpose. But most people don't do that. They just go to church and they get saved and woo you know, get a certificate and that's it. They stop there. Man, what a slap in the face to Jesus. Did he really die just to do that? No, man. He died to make you kings and queens and a royal priesthood. I mean, we got to do better than that, church. We got to do better than that. So Ephesians also said that all these things are in subjection to us through Christ, right? So all things are under our, our control. So that means if anything happens on this, on this earth, it's on our watch. It's because we allowed it as Christians. Just like all the wicked rulers in place, it's because the church didn't speak up. We allowed it to happen. What it really works out is we are the devil's master. We are the devil's master, but we are man's servant. We are man's servant. I'm your servant. But I am the devil's master. I tell him what to do, not the other way around. But look how many people are running in fear because of something. Look how many people are tolerating sickness. Look how many people are tolerating depression, all that stuff. That's the devil telling you what to do. Do not let him tell you what to do. Any kind of illness, any kind of sickness, any kind of disease is the devil having his way in you. I don't care what caused it. I don't care if it's environmental or you, you said, the doctor says you were born there. Whatever it is, it does not belong there. It's part of the fallen world. And the sooner you understand your dominion and take your place, the sooner you can get rid of it. Amen? But we got to walk towards that. So what is possible to the believer if they can walk in dominion? What's possible? 
Has anybody ever thought about that, what it'd be like? I mean, if you ever followed the life of Jesus, man, shh, that's awesome, the stuff that he's done. Look at Mark 9.23. Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believes. There it is right there. I could just stop right there. He said, all things are possible to him who believes. But I find it so interesting that the hardest thing for a Christian to do is to believe because they are so programmed by this messed up world, man. They just have a hard time grasping what the word of God is saying. I'm raising my hand too because we are programmed from our birth till we die to live the way the world lives. We're not programmed to live the way God wants us to live. That's why we have to renew our minds. How often? Every day, every day. Look at this next verse. Mark eleven twenty two, And Jesus answering said unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that you, or that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, shall not doubt, but shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass, he will, he shall have whatever he said. And he goes, Therefore I say unto you that whatsoever you desire, when you pray, the moment you pray, believe that you have received them, past tense, and you shall have them. The moment you pray, you got to pretend like it just manifested right in front of you. You got to start hooping and hollering and jumping up and down. See, you got to understand, church, when we pray, we pray from a position as we already got it, okay? We already got everything we could possibly need. All we're doing is basically going into the, the piggy bank of heaven and pulling it down, but it's already there. Everything you can possibly need is already there, but the reason why people don't get what they pray for is because they don't believe that they already have it. Because we have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Everything has been provided to us through Christ. Everything. We have all that we need. You remember how Jesus was saying, look at the birds of the air, look at the beasts of the field. They don't reap, they don't slow, they don't sow. But your heavenly Father provides for their every single need. Are you not much better than they? Are you not much better than they? If God has already given to the lesser creatures of the world, why would he not give to us? He's already given everything, but we've got this mindset that we still have to somehow achieve it, that we have to somehow work for it. It's already given, church. We already have it. We need to understand that. That's kingdom thinking. That's dominion thinking, that you already have the things that you need, but most people are thinking it as a future tense, like you have to grab it, but you're, the truth is you already do have it, and the only thing that's hindering you from you getting is the fact that you don't believe that you have it. You get what I'm saying? Make sense? Is this making sense at all, church? So when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. So what are some examples of dominion life? What are some examples of the dominion life? What about the story when Jesus rebuked the storm? Remember that story? Look at Mark 4.39. And he rose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. Because remember how the story goes. Jesus was in the boat with some other disciples, and he was chilling out, sleeping, having a siesta, right? Here comes a big old storm, shaking up the boat, blowing it all over the place. And they say, Master, we perish. Don't you care? We're about to die. They're all crying, ah, you know. And Jesus wakes up, oh, man, again, you know. And, and he says this. He arose, and he rebuked the wind, and he said, unto, he said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? Why are you so fearful? So number one, you see that fear is stopping the promises of God from manifesting. Fear is stopping them from living that dominion life. And where does fear come from, church? God did not give us a spirit of fear. He gave us a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Do you think they were operating in a spirit of power? No, they were operating in a spirit of fear. He said to the storm, peace and be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And then he said unto them, why are you so fearful? That fear was keeping them from operating in that dominion life, that fear, that spirit of fear. And he also said, how is it that you have no faith? You've seen me do all these things. You've been around me. You've walked with me. How is it that you still don't have faith? Because seeing is not believing. Believing is believing. When you believe in your heart, it's when you receive. Because you cannot do anything in the kingdom without believing. Everything is done by believing. It's not works. It's believing in the one whom God has sent, which is Jesus. That's how faith works. You have to believe. But they were hung up on what they saw, and they weren't able to walk in that dominion faith because of fear, number one. And number two, they were waiting on the physical miracles to manifest in front of them. They didn't have that faith that they should have had. But Jesus is still saying, I don't understand how you don't have faith. But when you really look at them, everything through history and biblical history, seeing is not believing. Seeing is actually hindrance to you. 
Because blessed is the man who believes who has not seen, is what Jesus said. It's, it would be more of a hindrance to you for you to see Jesus perform miracles in front of you. Why? Because you're always going to expect them. Your eyes are always going to want to see that to make the experience real. But if you believe in your heart, the devil can't take that. He can't interrupt that. That's where true power is. That's what true faith is. It's when you believe, not in your mind, but in your heart. When you know that you know that you know. And nothing can change your mind. Amen? So look at this. And he says, so why are you so fearful and how is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another. I love this statement. What kind of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? You got to, their probably jaws just drop, man. They probably made their own anchors out of their jaws. I mean, seeing somebody rebuke the storm and the wind like that, they're like, wow, how could you take that? That's awesome. I love that portion right there. So Jesus, what did he do there? That's a, a display of dominion over what? The earth. Over the earth. Remember God said we had dominion over everything on this earth? Well, he just did dominion over the earth right there. Now look at Mark 6.41. And when he had taken the five loaves, the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And to two fishes divided he among them all, and they did all eat and were filled. So this is the miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000. So we're talking about examples of dominion faith. The first example was a dominion faith was what? Jesus rebuking the storm. The second example of dominion faith was Jesus multiplying the food to feed the 5,000. Okay, isn't that awesome? So he has dominion over the animals. Dominion over the animals. Look at this next one in Luke 440. It says, Now when the sun was setting, all they had, all that they had, all that had any sick with diverse diseases brought them unto him. So everybody that was sick was getting brought to Jesus, right? And he laid hands on every one of them and healed them. Every last one of them, he healed them. And all devils, and devils also came out of many crying and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. So Jesus is right here. He's showing dominion over diseases, right? He's also showing dominion over what? Devils, over demons, over the spiritual aspect. So even the spiritual aspect we have dominion over. The interesting thing is the devils knew that he was the Christ who had power. Do the, do the devils know who you are? Do they know your name in heaven? Or in hell, do they know you have power and authority? That's something to consider. They should know your name. It's like, oh man, there comes oh man, there comes so and so, there comes Maria, there, there comes so. Oh man, I don't want to mess with that person. Mm -mm. Oh man, there comes that infinitely swift guy. Dude's fast. God, I'm out of here. You know, that's what you want the devils to say. There has been preachers um, who are so anointed by God because they, they, they paid the price for it. They went through everything they had to do to serve God, and they would just pass through towns on the way to revivals, and people would instantly get set free with the, without them even having to go to the house just because the demons knew that so-and-so was coming through the town, so-and-so had power, they couldn't even stand the glory of God, so they would just immediately vacate the premises, and the person wouldn't even have to say a word. Why? Because the guy is walking in dominion. That's what you want to do. That's what every single Christian should be able to do. Amen? You get what I'm saying? So the devil's going to know your name, amen? So Jesus gave this same power that he had to his followers. Same thing. Look at Luke 9.1. He says, Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils, not some devils, all devils, and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Now, if you notice that Jesus' ministry and everything the disciples did, they proved that they belonged to God. They proved they were from the kingdom of God, and they proved they had power by healing over and over and over again. You will see that same story. I'm proving to you that I'm from the kingdom of God by healing you. Let's get you healed. Now you know I'm genuine. Why? Because I got food to back it up. You see how that works out? Jesus' whole ministry was about healing people. Yes, the kingdom message was being preached, but he proved who he was. He proved that he was a son of God by a display of power. And what was that display of power? Healing people. 99.9% .9 of the time, yeah, he changed the, the fish and the loaves. And yes, he rebuked the storm. Yes, he changed the water into wine. But the main thing he did was heal people. It is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. Amen. And we need to walk like that. Now, in this particular example right here, you see power and authority. Now, power, that's the, that's the Greek word dunamis. That means miraculous power. That means miracle power. And the other one, authority, that's actually exousia. 
Now, power and authority are two different things. You can have all the power in the world, but if you have no authority to exercise it, you're dead in the water and vice versa. If you have authority but you have no power, it's like a little barking chihuahua. What are you going to do with it? You know, you got to have them both. Amen? you got to have them both, and Jesus gave us both. You understand? Amen? So what can we do to ensure, to make sure that we're on the path to dominion faith? What can we do to make sure we're walking in the right direction? Well, number one, you want to hear those who are preaching the truth. You don't want to, make, you don't want to sit in a church who's telling you lies. That's why I tell you guys and I tell everybody else, don't take my word for it. Look it up in the word of God. That's the reason why I provide so many scriptures. That's why the reason I pass out scripture sheets, look it up for yourself. If you don't agree with what I'm saying, study it out for yourself. Don't take my word for it because when you do that, you'll come into the revelation knowledge of it. I mean, I'm glad that you believe me, but I would prefer that you would pick up the word of God and study it for yourself. Take the scripture sheets and study out. That's what my sister does. A lot of people in here do that, and that's a good thing to do. So number one, you want to make sure you're hearing the people who are, treat, who are preaching the truth. And you also, number two, is you want to follow people of faith. You want to follow people who are doing the things that you want to do. Everything that Jesus said we should do, and then some, you want to find those people who are doing that. Because if the people are not doing that, they're not walking in the fullness of Christ. And if they're not teaching their congregation anything, if they're keeping their congregation in milk, then everybody's going to be drinking milk for the rest of life. They'll never turn into the fullness of Christ. And, you know, no condemnation to, to preachers who are doing that. Some preachers get very complacent in teaching just milk. They don't teach any meat. We're not supposed to live on milk. We're not supposed to stay babies. we got to grow up. We've got to grow up sooner or later. We've got to start chewing on that meat down to the bone and go on to the next thing because that's our mandate. That's what we are required to do as Christians. We're supposed to grow into the fullness of Christ. And when you are walking in the fullness of Christ, that means you walk like Jesus, you talk like Jesus, you're able to do everything that Jesus did. And if you're not there, then you're not in fullness. And I'm talking to everybody, including myself. That is our goal, church. That is our goal, not to stay in the milk, but to get to the meat. Amen? All right. And now Luke, and uh, I, I say Luke's a writer of Hebrews. But that's debatable. So Hebrews even says what I just told you right now. Look at this. He says that you would be not slothful, but be followers. Be followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises of God. So even right here, everything that I just told you, Hebrews is saying, follow those who are inheriting the promises of God through faith and patience. So if God says you're able to do these miracle signs and wonders in his name, because the Bible says, those who believe in my name, they will do what? They will speak with new tongues. They will cast out devils. They will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Those are promises. And there's, and there's people that you're following that are not inheriting those promises. It's because they have no faith or they have no patience or they have neither one of them. And we're supposed to follow the people that do. So if there's people who are preaching the word of God or even other Christians who are not walking in the promises of God and you don't see them manifesting, you're not supposed to follow them because wherever you follow them is where you will also go spiritually. You always want to follow people who are spiritually achieving the promises of God. Amen? See what I'm saying? Now, I'm not saying that a person has to have it perfect. Don't get me wrong. I don't have it perfect. I'm far from it. But I'm walking in the right direction. And I'm preaching the truth, and I know that. And anybody's welcome to challenge me on that because I have fruit to back it up. And God's good, amen? So you want to follow teachers who have faith and fruit, right? Follow the ones who are doing what you want to do. Now, these are the kind of teachers that the Lord was talking about in the fivefold ministry. These are the teachers that God has given us to be a blessing to the kingdom. Look at Ephesians 4.11. He said, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So we're considered in a state where we're being perfected to look like Jesus. So all the evangelists, the prophets, the teachers, the pastors, they're supposed to be, look like Jesus themselves. They themselves are supposed to walk and talk like Jesus. These are the people you want to follow. Like I said, no one's going to have it perfect. They may, not, they may not have it all down, but if you know that they're preaching Scripture and they're preaching truth and they're at least walking towards it, that's a good person to associate yourself with. But if they're walking in the opposite direction saying, oh, well, God puts diseases on his children to teach them a lesson or healing was not anymore or all the, all the miracles died with the apostles and all that, that's just flat-out lie. Oh, there's no baptism of the Holy Spirit. All those are flat out lies, man. And if anybody's teaching that, you need to get away from them because they're part of the apostate church and they're going to get dealt with. God, so generous and so loving and so kind, but they're going to have to answer for all that. We all are. That's why I take this so serious. You get what I'm saying, church? 
So we don't want to follow the people or the teachers who are, are full of unbelief. But there's, there's a biblical reason for that. Look at 1 Corinthians 15.33. It says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. If you're going, if you're shooting for the moon, but you're hanging around people who are dwelling on the earth and don't want to go any higher than that, you will never get any higher than the people you surround yourself with. If your goal is to get to the moon, then you need to start hanging out with people who are trying to go to the moon. Because if you hang out with the people who are happy just sitting on earth, you'll never get any higher than that spiritually. And that is the sad truth. And nothing's going to change it because that's a spiritual law. So you got to change your company. you got to make sure you're hanging around the people who are seeking the truth and after that truth. Now look at this. The Lord gives us an example of the type of people we need to follow. Everybody with me, church? Woo! All right. Woo! Round two. Okay, here we go. 1 Thessalonians 1.5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power. Not just spoken word. You've got to have fruit to back it up. It's supposed to be preached with power and in the Holy Ghost. And in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So they're proving what kind of men they are because they're preaching this gospel with power. Okay, And you became followers of us because of this power, because we proved to you that we belong to God by doing all these miracle signs of wonder. We proved that we're walking in power and authority. Because of that, you're following us. This is what he's saying. And you became followers of us. And the Lord, having received word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Ghost. So Paul is telling us that the word of God must come with power for it to be genuine. For it to be genuine. Otherwise, it's just a word. That Church, you got to understand that this, this is dominion faith when you have power to back it up, okay? Other than that, how are you different from any other church? How are you different from any other religion out there if you don't have power to back up what you're preaching? How are we different from anybody else? How can Christianity be different from all the other thousands of religions out there if we do not set apart, ourselves apart by walking in power? Do you understand what I'm saying? Christianity is not different than anybody else unless there's power to back up the Word of God. And if, and, and if our heart is right, we're chasing God, but there's no power, that means we're missing something. So we need to figure out what we're missing, and we need to get it. It may be the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It may be unbelief. It may be you're, you're still given to the ways of the world and not walk, walking in righteousness and holiness. Whatever it is, you need to find out what it is, church, and you need to squash it, and you need to get rid of it because you got a job to do. I can't be the only one up here doing this and, th and preaching like this. There's got to be people who are doing and saying the same thing I'm saying because that's truth. And we all are responsible for that truth, and we all have to give an answer to God one day for whether or not we preach the truth. You get what I'm saying? No, one, no one's going to get away with living a lazy life down here. We're going to answer for that in heaven eternally. You may all make it. You may be sweeping the streets of gold, or you may be Jesus' right-hand man. But it all depends on how you serve him down here. The better you serve him down there, the better position you're going to have up there. And that's just a biblical fact. Don't be lazy with your salvation. Don't waste it. Because what you do here is going to earn you an eternal reward and placement up there forever. Okay? You don't want to miss out on a promotion. You know what I'm saying? So this is how the word was meant to be preached. It's meant to be preached with power. Now, Paul gives us some more examples of this. Check this out. Romans 15, 19. Through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about into Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. With what? With power. With power. Now, Paul said that through signs and wonders, he preached the gospel by the power of who? The Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit. So if you're missing the baptism of the Holy Spirit, man, we, we got to get up, we got to get you up to date because that's where the power is. We, we were given the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the endowment of power for service, to serve God, to be a witness. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit just lights your heart on fire for God. I mean, it's a night and day difference, you know. And I know there's some people who are listening to me right now who don't have that yet, but they're praying for it. And I believe that God's going to bless them with that. But here's the deal. You, you, when you, when the moment you're saved, you have everything you need to go to heaven, right? And you have the faith to do anything you need to do, okay? But when you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that makes your love for Christ, your love for the gospel, just takes it to the next level. So you find more in love with God, and the working of miracles and powers is even easier. Why? Because the Holy Ghost, who is the, who is the, the powerhouse, is there. You know, he's got you now. So that baptism of power is an endowment for service. It's an endowment of power for service. Now look at this. So why did Paul preach the word with signs and wonders? Why was the gospel preached like that? What was the purpose of it? I told you earlier, did you catch it? Why was the gospel preached with power? Because it, number one, 
it makes us different from all these other religions, right? But number two, the main thing is it actually confirms God's word. When you preach with power, you confirm God's word. Look at this, Mark 16, 20. He says, and they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord was working with them and confirming the word with what? With signs following. Those signs are power. Amen. Amen. That's how God's word is confirmed. So the word gives us much more confirmation on this dominion faith that we're supposed to live. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 18, or 4 and 18. It says, now some are puffed up as though I would not come to you, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord willing, and will know not the speech of them. I will know not the speech of them that are puffed up, but I'll know them by their power. These people may have fancy degrees and may be able to talk 100 miles an hour and have all these fancy words, but how am I going to know them? Paul is saying, how am I really going to know them? By their power. I want to see what kind of power they have. I want to see if they're all talk. Let me see. Show me the fruit. Show me the money. Let me see the proof. Let me see your power. That's how Paul knows them. That's how everybody in the kingdom of God back then was, that's how they were identified as belonging to Christ, belonging to God, is their display of power. If they had no power, then sorry, you couldn't pass as a Christian. Today, people throw that word, oh, I'm a Christian, this and that. All right, where's your power? Huh? What are you talking about? What do you mean power? Never mind. See you later. There's no way that today's Christians could have proved that they were Christians back then because nobody walks in power. Nobody even, people don't even preach the truth, for crying out loud. They preach lies about my Father in heaven, and I can't stand it. I don't like them to be lying about my God. I know who he is, and he loves us, and he's given us the keys to the kingdom, and he's given us all power and authority over everything on this earth. Amen? And that's how we're supposed to walk. That's how we're supposed to walk. He says, so for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. But in power. So Paul tells us why the Lord or, or why the word of God must be preached with dominion faith. Because it proves God's genuine. It proves his word. Now look at this. Where are we at right there? Now look at this next one. 1 Corinthians 2, 4, it says, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. I'm not leaning on my own wisdom here. I'm not coming and speaking all these uh, fancy words and lingo to you. But I'm coming in the demonstration of the Spirit and of what? Power. Of power. I am showing you that I got power. I'm showing you what the Holy Spirit can do through me. So that, and for what reason? That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. So your faith doesn't stand in your 10 doctrines or your 10 doctorates or all this education. Your faith should not stand in your education, but it should stand in the power of God, in the power of God. So our faith must stand in the power of God and not in anything else. Because, you know, all the worldly wisdom and the intellect and men, they will all let you down, but God never will. He will never let you down. So when Paul was walking in dominion faith, he was working the works of God. He was actually working the works of God. Do you know what I mean when I say he was working the works of God? I'm going to show you. Look at John 9.4. I'm almost done here, church. John 9.4 says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Now, I'm just going to explain this last portion here. They didn't have electricity back then. So when lights were out, nobody could do any work anymore because it was so dark. So that's why he's talking about right here. I must work the works of him that sent me while it's daytime because when night comes, it makes it really hard. Got to run on with a candle everywhere and my hair might catch on fire. So that's what he's talking about right here. So what are the works of God? Everything that Jesus did. Raised dead, healed the sick, cleansed the lepers, cast out demons, multiply the fish and loaves. Those are all the works of God. Okay? So... These works, you have to understand, they're not our works. They're God's work, meaning God is the one who does them through us, through us. You know what I'm saying? You on your own could never do anything. You couldn't raise the dead. You couldn't heal anything. But God can through you if you allow him. Okay? So what must we do to work the works of God? How do we let God work through us? What is it we have to do? It tells us right here in John 6, 28. Then said they unto me, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? That question I just asked you. And Jesus said this, this is the work of God, that you would believe on him who he has sent. Believe on Jesus. That's how you work the works of God, to believe in Jesus and who he is, what he has done, and who, where, your, where your dominion is established through. To believe on Jesus. That is the answer. That's how you work the works of God. Because remember I told you earlier, nothing in the kingdom of God can be done without faith and nothing, you can't have faith without believing. 
So you have to believe on Jesus. That is always the answer is to believe on Jesus. He did it all. He literally did it all. When you believe on Jesus, you take in full value who he is and what he has done and what it means. God will work through you. Why? Because you're just the filter. But most people are, are, are acting like the barricade instead of the filter. They're not letting God work through them because of their unbelief. So God can't work miracle power through them because their soul is not renewed. Their mind is not renewed to what the Word of God really says. They're trapped in lies. Or they're trapped in doctrines from, you know, that are just wrong. And because of that, the power of God doesn't flow because of our unbelief. It's always an unbelief. It's not really a matter of faith. It's unbelief. If your unbelief is stronger than your faith, then guess who's going to win? Unbelief. So we don't do the miracle works of God. That's his job. Okay, Our job is to simply believe in Jesus to believe on him and what it represents and what he means and what it means to trust him so he can work through us. So in order to work the works of God, you must believe. True dominion faith is, is, is exactly that. It's considering the work done. It's believing in God. When you have faith, the moment you say something, the moment you pray, it's done, you got it, and you walk away from it, and you never think about it again. Why? Because you know what's done. You just wait for it to manifest. Could be instant, it could be a week from now, whatever it is, but you believe and you rest because you're not worrying about it anymore. Okay? So what do you do when the work is done? You rest, right? This is what Hebrews says in 4.11. Watch this. He says, let us therefore labor. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So what's he talking about here? Well, let me, let me back up a second. What did God do in creation? How many, how many days did he create? Six. What did he do on the seventh day? Why? Because it was done. He did it all. He did nothing else for him to do, so he sat back and chilled out. This is how your prayer life is supposed to work. The moment you pray something, you consider it done, and you rest. And you just wait to receive it. You get what I'm saying? This is how faith is supposed to be, but most people don't do that. They they're keep going back to, oh, well, I prayed for this. Oh, I don't know if God's going to do it or this or that. Or they keep going back and looking at something that shows that they're in unbelief. You cannot inherit the promises of God of unbelief because true faith, true dominion faith considers it done. The moment it leaves your lips, done. And you're, com and you're completely convinced about it, completely convinced that it's done. It's just like this. If I had a bonfire outside, how many of you would doubt at all for a second that if you stuck your hands in there, that you would get burned? Everybody, either from experience or from what they learned, through repetition, knows that when you stick your hand in fire, you're going to get burned. And there's no doubt about it. This is how it's supposed to be with what we pray for. All doubt should be removed. The moment it leaves your lips, you need to pray from the position like, I already have that in heaven, and I'm just confessing it out loud so God can bring it to pass. But I already have it because it's been provided to me through Jesus. I have everything I possibly need. All provision has been provided to me. And it's done. So the moment I ask for it, I already know it's done. I consider it done. That's why Jesus said, the moment you pray, believe, and you shall receive. Believe that you have received it, past tense, because you already have it, and that's the truth. You have to pray from a position as if I already have. But what I'm saying is, even though you can't see it, you have to act like it's already there. That's what I'm trying to say. Even though you can't see it, you have to act like it's already there, because seeing is not believing. So everything in God's kingdom works by faith, which is believing, all right? So you must get to the point of believing so that you can rest in your faith, knowing that you have already have what you have prayed for. It's already done, okay? So what was the example of unbelief? Do you remember what the example of unbelief was? Israel, how long did they spend in the forest? How long did they spend in the wilderness? Forty years, right? And they never inherited the promises of God. They never inherited the promised land. They fell. They died in the wilderness after 40 years. Look at this, Hebrews 3.18. And to whom did he swear that they would not enter into his rest? Remember, rest considers it done. Rest means you have the faith to believe everything God has told you. And they never entered into his rest. They were disobedient. In verse 19, it says, So we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. Unbelief will keep you from achieving the promises of God. They will keep you from coming into that rest. Because whenever you pray for something, if you really do believe that you, you got it the moment you prayed, you're going to be at rest. You're not going to worry about it anymore. It'll be done. That's what it means to enter into his rest. And that comes from a dominion life. It comes from dominion faith. It's a matter of believing. It's not a matter of effort. It's a matter of believing because faith without works is dead. So what do you do to work the works? You believe. That's what you do to work the works, and the faith without works is dead. So what is the work? You believe. How many of you know it's, it's hard work to believe sometimes? Okay? So the main work of faith is rest. That is the main work of faith is rest. 
So faith without rest is dead. Faith without believing is dead. Because if you don't believe, then you have no faith. So until you rest, you're really not in faith. Until you rest, you're not in faith. Until you consider it done, you're not in faith. And you can ask until the cows come home. But until you truly believe it, and you're like, man, you know what, God? You got it. It's done. I'm going to sit down and chill out because I know it's done. When you get to that point, you got it. That's faith. And all you have to do at that point is endure patience. You just have to wait and trust God. Don't put unbelief in front of you. Put only faith in front of you because the devil will try to come and get you to doubt. And he'll try to steal that thing away from you that you believe for. Okay? So how do I know if I have dominion faith? How do you know if you're walking in dominion faith? Well, number one, you're going to be at rest because you've considered it done. So dominion faith, we got one more scripture here. Dominion faith requires you to be at rest. It requires you to be at rest so that the truth Jesus spoke in Mark would come to pass. And I'm going to read Mark to you one more time. What this next scripture I'm going to show you, this last scripture requires you to have dominion faith for it to apply to you. Mark 11, 22 through 24. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou not cast, cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass. You have to believe. And it says, He shall have whatever he says. And he says again in verse 24, Therefore I say unto you that what so what things soever you desire, whatever you desire, whatever it is, when you pray, Believe that you received them. Believe that you already have them the moment you prayed. It's like you're praying and you already have it in your hands. Lord, I, I want this tablet. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I know the tablet's right there, so I already got it. I'm praying because I already know I have it. It's in my hands. I'm praying and asking for it, but I already know I have it because it's right here in my hands, even though I don't see it. You see how that's kind of how people can't grasp around that? But that's what it means. When you pray, you pray like you already have. You don't pray to get, you pray because you have. That's what I was trying to say earlier, and I jumbled it all up. You pray because you have, not because you're trying to get. You get what I'm saying? You don't pray from that standpoint of trying to get. You pray because you already have. Even though you don't see it, seeing is not believing, God will manifest it in his time. Your job is to believe. Your, God, your job is to trust. It says, therefore, I say unto you that whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. And you shall shall have them. Is there any doubt at all that God is a good God? Is there any doubt at all that God has given us dominion, faith to reign and to rule in this world? He has given us every good thing, everything we could possibly live, uh, a need to be functional in this world as a true Bible-believing Christian, to be a son or a daughter of God. Is there any doubt at all of how good God is? 